Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen, for having me here. It's an honor to be presenting in front of you. Um, <clears throat> how long do I have? Half an hour. OK. OK. If you, if, you, if you donate money, you can have all mine. I can donate money. <laughs> OK, I'll talk to you tonight about um, the Wheel of Fortune. I'm being honored to present in front of you, and um, most of you have 10 times more experience in life than I do. But I developed this concept about the Wheel of Fortune um, throughout what I went through in my life. Your position on this wheel is determined by an influence by many factors, uh, but what I learned is that your position, the main steerer is yourself. And that would determine where you be at. I'm a bit taller than you, Chris. At the moment, I, I guess I'm somewhere up here at the top of the wheel. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have very successful business in Sydney. I do a lot of hip and knees. Hip and knees, hip and knees is very boring. And I have a big passion about this um, science fiction kind of uh, surgery, which is called OSI integration. And well done, you said it very well. Um, what is OSI integration? OSI integration is basically um, kind of um, attaching a robotic uh, limb to a human body, and they integrate together and they become one piece. Pretty much like the Terminator, the movie that I watched when I was at the age of 12. Uh, which fascinated me about doing surgery, basically. And thanks to Australia, that dream was uh, become true um, only because I'm here. Otherwise, um, it would be only a dream. Um, I just came back from um, um, Cambodia, and where we did the first four osseointegration integration surgeries or robotic leg surgeries in a developing country, which was um, a really um, um, mind-blowing experience. Uh, these people in Cambodia were <laughs> so positive, so full of happiness, and you look at them and you say they deserve to have a good life, like any other human beings anywhere around this globe. Um, however, my story didn't start there. I was born in Baghdad. That city that um, we watch on TV, um, mainly on SBS, um, and it's usually horrible stories. Um, Baghdad, the city that I was born in, was pretty much like Sydney, believe it or not. It was very cosmopolitan, except the fireworks were real. <laughs> I raised up to a very privileged family. My family were second to the Iraqi throne. Um, and um, so I had a silver spoon in my mouth um, from the beginning. I was very spoiled brat, basically. However, I learned a lot of lessons from my family, valuable lessons um, that I should question and I should um, do whatever I think is right. Um, no matter what I'm told, I have to think about it and I have to question it and I have to decide if it's going to hurt, hurt or harm um, anyone, then I shouldn't do it. I raised up and I watched The Terminator and I decided to do medicine and um, I did that and then I graduated. Everything was fine. I never thought about leaving Iraq, never thought about leaving Baghdad because I had a very happy life, similar to millions of Syrians nowadays who are running uh, cross borders in Europe. Um, these people didn't ever think about leaving their country a few years ago. Until that day, when I was a first year medical resident or surgical resident, um, I parked my car in Baghdad University Hospital and um, going to the theater complex as usual, um, all of a sudden I faced that the most challenging moment in my whole entire life would change me forever. There were Three busloads of army deserters escorted by the Republican Guards and the Ba'ath Party members, Saddam's party. They ordered the hospital to abandon the elective list and to start deforming these people by taking part of their e off. 
humanely under anesthetics. The head of the department, which was my boss, refused publicly and he said, this is against the Hippocrate oath, do no harm. They simply escorted him outside to the car park. They put a bullet in his head in front of everybody and then turned to the rest of us and they said, well now ladies and gentlemen, we attracted your attention. Anyone share this man's view, please come forward. Otherwise proceed with our orders. I faced the most important challenge and the most difficult challenge in my life. Should I disobey the command and follow my boss with the same faith? Should I obey and live with guilt for the rest of my life, violating every single principle I was raised on? But hang on, I thought about a different option. There was a female toilet in the theater complex. I managed to escape there. I spent five hours in the female toilet. It was a really dark time. Until the surgery is finished and then from there onward I became an escapee and, and a traitor obviously and the punishment of any traitors to Saddam's regime regardless of your race or color or ethnicity is punish, um, punishment by death. With the help of my family I managed to be smuggled outside Iraq to Jordan. Jordan was not safe and then as an Iraqi national, the only place on earth that would give me a visa um, was Malaysia. And they give you a visa for 14 days. So I decided to take that, that, that trip to, to KL and see if there is any light at the end of the dark tunnel. And then from there onward, um, life and events um, played major, luck played major role in my life. In Abu Dhabi airport, I met two young men. They were Iraqis as well, and they looked very rough. And I started talking to them, and they were very nervous because they couldn't speak English. And um, funny enough, I asked them, where are you guys going? And they said, oh, we are tourists. And I said, yeah, right, you look very touristy to me. You don't even speak the language. <laughs> and then they realized that I can talk, um, and I can speak in English a little bit, so they they found me useful. They said, well, if you come with us and interpret for us, we may be able to help you. We landed in um, KL, and they had a small piece of paper with a number written on it. And they said, well, we have this number with us, and we need to dial the number. So we dialed the number, and there was my first um, introduction to a people smuggler, was Mehdi. Um, on the other line, he said, well, look, come over here, meet me in Chowket, which is the area where they sell fake watches and Louis Vuitton bags. And uh, he said, there's only one McDonald's over there. I'll be standing in front of McDonald's. We took the taxi, we stopped there, and here we go. A guy, um, blue eyes, blonde, um, and wearing um, a brown shirt and brown um, shorts and a hat. He looked like Steve Irwin, basically. I thought, what the hell? Started talking to him in English and he was wondering why I'm speaking English. And then he turned out to be an Iraqi Kurd. And um, he took us aside and he said, well, look guys, you're here in Malaysia. Give me this amount of money and um, give me your passports and I'll come back tomorrow with uh, your next destination. And, <coughs> sorry, thinking about my father and what's his, what he advised me with, I started questioning him and I said, hang on. Um, I met you for the first time now. Do you expect me to trust you with this amount of money and my passport and you're going to come back tomorrow? And he got really offended and he said, how dare you? You question my credibility. I'm a respectable smuggler. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's logical. <laughs> and um, anyway, and he said, listen, smartass, do you have any other choice? I said, well, no. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I gave him the money and he didn't turn up to be a, only a respectable smuggler, but he was very accurate. He came back next day with first class tickets Garuda Airlines and to Jakarta. And I don't know which part of my journey was the scariest, but anyway. <laughs> and he said, well look, um, you're going to land in Jakarta. Don't go to the woman with the cover, with the, cover, with the head cover. Don't go to the guy with the beard, don't go to the guy with the high rank, with the many stars, go to the guy with the one star, put a hundred dollars in your passports and give him the passport and this is a piece of paper with a small number written on it, dial the number after you get in. And I said, hang on, I need to ask you a question. He said, what's that? And I said, are you expecting me to bribe a, 
a custom officer in a major international airport? He said, yes. I said, oh, okay, well, I'm just checking. <laughs> we landed in Jakarta, everything went smooth. We um, got to um, um, Jakarta and we dialed the number and there was this time another people smuggler, his name is Omid, and he said, well, another Kurdish guy. Um, and he said, well, you need to go to the outskirts of Jakarta and um, um, I'll give you uh, the address. And uh, we got there after an hour plus uh, drive in the taxi. And then really the tunnel um, become darker because when I got there, there was um, a six story building, like two star hotel and looked like uh, Baghdad Central Market. There were a lot of uh, Middle Eastern people, hundreds of them. Then that was the first time where I met the queue. And um, you know, the government keep talking about the queue. Um, it was the queue over there. And, uh, and we started talking to people in the foyer and people were saying, we've been waiting for six months, seven months, eight months, you name it. And it was a very dire situation. Um, everybody was uh, desperate, they were hopeless and they didn't know where they were going. And um, these two guys that accompanied me played a major role again in saving my life. They started talking to people and they introduced themselves. One of them is a painter, the other one is a plasterer, and this one is a doctor. So the word spread around that there is a doctor in the, in the hotel. Anyway, I took my key and went to the, uh, to the room very depressed and I thought, what am I going to be doing here? Mind you, uh, just to clarify one thing is that all the countries that we pass through um, to come to Australia as boat people uh, are not signatory to the Geneva Convention Article 1951. So you can't go to the UNHCR or you can't go to the police station to say, hey, I'm a refugee, help me, because they will put you in a plane, send you back to Iraq and get head, your head chopped off. Um, so anyway, I got to my room and then two hours later, the um, 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 respectable smuggler um, Omid this time came wearing black and black and I think they have different uniforms in different countries and um, and he said oh can I come in and I said yes come in what do I what can I do for you and he said look I pray to God that God will provide me with a mullah and the mullah will come from Iran tomorrow and I uh, and the mullah is coming with his daughter and the daughter is pregnant and her last trans minister and uh, I pray to God that God will provide me with a doctor to help the mullah's daughter to pass the journey so the mullah can concentrate on protecting the boat. And I said, okay, and what's going on? He said, well, I have a boat going to Australia in two days. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, of course I'm interested. And that was the first time for me to know I'm going to Australia. Um, the lucky land. <laughs> so, um, uh, Obviously, um, and he said, what do you need? And I said, well, how many people will be on the boat other than the VIP mullah who's going to protect the boat and me protecting the mullah's daughter? And, um, and he said, well, uh, there will be 50 people on the boat and what do you need for them? And I said, well, I need 100 drips, 100 IV saline, a lot of cannulas, a lot of anti-emetic drugs, a lot of injectable, um, uh, you know, Maxalone. And he said, okay, that's fine, I'll get all of that. And I said, hang on. These are all medical supplies. You can't just go to the chemist and buy them. You need to have connection. He said, listen, I'm very connected. Did you see all these police cars outside the hotel? And I say, yeah, there were a few of them. And he said, they're all for my security. <laughs> I said, okay, well, that's good. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of police cars outside, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, um, unfortunately, this... Uh, Omid the smuggler was not as genuine as Mahdi the smuggler because the, he said there will be 50 people. We traveled, we were around 50 in the bus, we traveled for over 24 hours or under 24 hours and um, when we got there there were two other buses with us. We ended up 165 people crammed like sardines vertically on a leaky boat, not seaworthy, um, heading to Australia. And uh, the funny thing is that we started traveling in the morning around 7 o'clock and then the sun started rising up and I could see that there was a big ship with large numbers tailing us. And uh, I was waiting for this torpedo to come from that ship. But funny enough, when we just got to international waters, our boat stopped. And then the ship came very close to us and a dinghy came from that ship, parked beside us. And then the skipper on our boat looked at us and he said, 
Okay, head straight. In 30 hours, you will reach Christmas Island. He had a small Tum Tum navigation, rudimentary um, uh, navigation system, and he said, well, if you miss Christmas Island, in two weeks you'll reach the mainland. And if you miss the mainland and you get to a, a wide, cold desert with a lot of penguins, head back, you went too far. <laughs> and he said, well, my journey ends here. He jumped on the dinghy and left, and we were left to the element on our own. I mean, it sounds very funny, but it wasn't. I was shitting myself. Oh, everybody was, anyway. Um, we ended up on the boat heading to Christmas Island. It was very rough seas. Um, the, um, the water, the, it was raining all the time and um, the boat was rocking constantly. At the end of the journey, um, we were lucky that there was an Iraqi um, Navy escapee who uh, managed to navigate the boat to Christmas Island successfully. By the time we got there, um, there were less than 10 of us who were conscious, and the rest were uh, lying on top of each other, uh, drowning in their uh, body fluid, uh, and you name it. Um, when we reached Christmas Island, we were received by the federal police. It was 1999. We got there on 8th of September no, and 8th of November 1999. We had the best reception from the federal police. There was a captain, his deputy, and three other people on the island uh, who were running the, the place. They took us to a basketball stadium, and thanks to the Salvation Army, uh, they gave us clean clothes. We got changed, we had a shower, we, had, um, we managed to get to the toilet. And then I started interpreting for people and started talking to the captain of the, uh, the federal police. And he was so lovely. And, um, um, he introduced me to his deputy and he said, when you get out of the detention center, I want you to go to a place called Tasmania. This guy come from there, show him your scar. And he showed me a scar, he had a clavicle fracture, I think, and was fixed. And he said, we had to chop off one of his heads and a few of his fingers to look like this. I didn't understand the joke back then. <laughs> Funny, I gave this. Uh, I gave a talk in Launceston the other day, and I told them, "Oh, you all had surgeries." <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't funny. <laughs> anyway, uh, few things happen in Christmas Island. Um, one of them is that on the third day, the captain came to me early in the morning. He woke me up and he said, "Wake up!" And I said, "What's wrong?" And he said, "Look." Majority of people on the boat with you are Muslims, aren't they? And I said, yes. And he said, they do not eat pig, do they? And I said, no. And he said, do you realize that I've been feeding you ham sandwiches for the last three days? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I need to tell them. And I said, no. <laughs> I didn't know that Islamic State existed. Um, anyway, so I said to him, listen, mate, there is a mullah and there is 165 people, except me. <laughs> They will take over the island and they will have a flag and all that stuff. Anyway, it took him um, um, to take his pistol out of his pocket to calm them down. Um, one important thing on Christmas Island that happened to me that I remember forever. And um, that's when I first, when I saw the best human kindness. Um, on the fourth day, I think, another boat came to Christmas Island and I was taken by the federal police to interpret and we went on two, two barges, sorry I keep hitting this, um, and one barge there was the captain and his deputy and on another barge there was another official who is a person that I met for the first time ever. Um, he asked me the question when we got into the water and he said when was the last time he spoke to your family and I said well just before I left Jakarta. And he said, so your family don't know if you're alive or dead? I said, no. He pulled out a satellite phone from his pocket. He gave me the phone and he dialed, He said to me, dial the number, ring your family and tell them you're safe and they may not hear from you for a few more years. He said, don't let anyone see you because my job is on the line. This guy broke the law just to help another fellow human being who he never met before. Forever I'm thankful for him, and every time I say that, my eyes go into tears. I don't even know his name, so thank you to him. Um, 
I managed to get to my mum and she knew that I was safe. But the 164 people who were in the basketball stadium, none of them could, could manage to speak to their families for months and months and months. I was the lucky one. Anyway, it turned out that the boat was full of Vietnamese people, so I was hopeless and uh, couldn't interpret any of them. We managed to leave to Curtin Detention Center and I got very upset because I was the last person to leave and um, I spoke to them because, you know, if I'm the last number to leave, that means I'm the last number to be processed. And, um, and the captain on the island said to me, don't be upset because uh, life is different on the mainland, especially in Curtin Detention Center, so enjoy it while you can here. And he was right. The minute we got handed over to the ACM, things changed. We were shoved, we were treated like animals. The ACM officials or officers were very harsh. We got to Christmas Island, we got to, sorry, Curtin Detention Center. Um, we were given a towel, a toothbrush, a pair of thongs, and um, we were stripped of our humanity. I was given a number 982, and I was called 982 for the rest of the time that I spent in Curtin. No matter how I describe the situation in Curtin, I cannot give it its justice. It was hell on earth. It is a shame to have such a detention center or such a system in such a well-civilized country. I can give you an example of how to compare Curtin Detention Center, that the, the center that I spent 10 months in. Being me, I questioned the authority and I kept causing a lot of headache to Philip Product and the Department of Immigration. I made friends with some of the people from within and they smuggled the camera and um, smuggled the laptop and I started writing letters and I started taking photos. And if you Google um, Curtin Detention Center, a lot of the photos you will see are mine. Unfortunately, funny enough, um, we tried to publish these and no news agency or um, newspaper or any uh, media uh, would accept it. I don't know why, until a major breakout happened in June 2000. So as a result of me being very naughty, I spent a lot of time in jails in Western Australia. From the Derby lockup, which was my favorite place, every weekend I go there for, for a visit, or every, almost every weekend, to Broome Maximum Security Prison, to Karatha Jail, and you name it. And I really strongly recommend the prison system in Western Australia, it's really great. <laughs> I mean, I was treated like a human being, I was wearing scrubs, it's a bit different color, but I was treating like a human, that's very important. I was called by my name, I had proper food, and what's more important than that, I had access to a phone, so I caused a lot more damage. <laughs> So anyway, so you name it, I spoke to Amnesty International, Red Cross, Human Rights Commission, and then when the Department of Immigration realized that, they put me back in detention center. And this time, they put me in a place called the um, uh, Suicide Watch Box, and it was one and a half meter by two and a half meter uh, box, and it has a small hole in the door, um, there is no windows, and there is an air conditioner, and a fluorescent light, which is purple 24 hours a day, and a mattress, there's no sheets, no pillows, so I don't hang myself or suffocate myself. And I was sitting there for 22 hours and they take me out for exercises for two hours, which was fantastic. I had to go on a hunger strike so they can give me my book, which is the last anatomy book that I brought with me from Iraq. And funny, the, the immigration official was so surprised that I broke my hunger strike because I had my book. And I said to him, well, why did you take it from me anyway? So it didn't make sense and he didn't understand me. Um, so anyway, thanks to the Department of Immigration, I studied very hard because they took me out from there to the, they upgraded me to the hotel, which is again another VIP place where I'm isolated by myself, but at least I don't have to knock on the door to go to the toilet, I have my own toilet, which is fantastic. Funny enough, just reaching the Sydney Olympics time, uh, the Department of Immigration started pub, um, processing people very quickly, and the hourglass started working and sands were dropping from one end of the hourglass to the other end. 980 was processed, 981 was processed, 983 was processed, 984 was processed, and miraculously 982 was not processed. 
So I was missed. I didn't exist as a human being. Obviously, they were head counting me four times a day, uh, but I didn't exist on papers. For 40 days, I did not exist. And it took luck again and human kindness from someone from within the detention center who were processed to tell them that there is a bastard over there in isolation that exists who who told his solicitor to call my mom in Iraq in Baghdad who called a lawyer or a solicitor in Sydney who called the Department of Immigration and put my papers and uh, my papers as representative of me and that's the only way I was processed otherwise I would be rotten there go for God knows for how long anyway eventually I was found to be a legitimate refugee and I was released and um, just to make it more funny um, the group that I was supposed to leave with um, were flown to to Brisbane and um, the the department official came uh, department of immigration official in the, in the detention came to me and he said well look you speak English so we thought that we're not going to fly you to Brisbane you can go out and I said go out where and he said well out here and I said well we are in Curtin it's northwest of Australia in the middle of nowhere and he said no but there is a bus that come from Derby to Broome you can catch the bus I said okay that's fine so I walked out I stand in the street <laughs> for myself catching the bus <laughs> which was the first event that I've done in Australia which was fantastic and I thought about it and I thought look I mean, this guy wanted to punish me for what I've done. Okay, fine. Well, I'll make use of it. So it was the only opportunity for me to circumnavigate Australia by bus. So I took the bus from Derby to Broome, from Broome to Perth, from Perth to Adelaide, to Melbourne, to Sydney. It was fantastic. <laughs> the funny thing is that... <laughs> the funny thing is that... I was very determined that I'll, I'll work because, um, you know... Um, from childhood, my father kept digging my head, work is an honor. A person who has no work, and if he's capable of work and he doesn't work, he has no honor. And that was the sentence that I wake up on and sleep on. So I had to find myself a job. So I went to Perth two days after I was released um, to Royal Perth Hospital. I knocked on their door. The reception looked at me. She said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I need the on-call doctor. Can you call him for me? And I said, okay. What do you want from me? I said, well, I'm a doctor, I need to talk to him. And it, funny enough, it turned out to be an Iraqi doctor. And, and he came to me and he said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, look, I'm a doctor. I just got out of the detention center two days ago. Can you get me a job? And he said, are you kidding me? I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he said, well, you need to go to the farms, collect some fruit, sit for your exam, and then once you pass your exam, you apply, and then if, you f if you're lucky, you might find a job. And he said, anyway, what do you want to do? Um, in specialization when, when, you, when, you, when you get a job. I said, well, I want to do orthopedic surgery because I want to do robots. And he looked at me and shook his head. Anyway, and then I realized why he did that. Um, so I thought that Perth is not my place uh, because he turned me down. I went to Adelaide, it was the same thing. Went to Melbourne, it was the same thing. And then I realized maybe my approach is a bit wrong. So I had some money left on me. I called my mum and I said, Mum, what shall I do? And she sent me my papers and um, um, I spent all my money on buying a computer, a printer and a lot of reflex paper. I printed out my CV with the help of the uh, officials in Centrelink, thanks to them. Um, I was released on the 26th of August 2000 and um, Within two weeks, surprise, surprise, I got two job interviews, one from Muldura, one from Shipperton, and um, from the 26th of August, where I started looking for a job, I managed to receive my first paycheck on the 1st of November 2000, so I'm terribly sorry for spending your money for two months on taxpayers. And then I started climbing the ladder, and my position on the Wheel of Fortune kept going up, and I thought, wow, this is fantastic, and uh, this is the, the, the um, lucky land, not America, until I received this wake-up call. I worked my, uh, very hard, and, um, <laughs> okay. and then I managed to get on the orthopedic training scheme, and I felt like calling this guy and telling him, I told you I'm going to do orthopedics, and, uh, and then, sadly, uh, on the welcome uh, dinner, I uh, received two of my colleagues who came to me, talking among themselves to my face, and they said, what a disaster that um, the orthopedic training scheme standards has dropped so much, 
to allow a refugee to be one of us. And I looked at them and I said, wow, you guys are sad. Um, so anyway, that didn't deter me and I decided that I'll show these guys that uh, I can do it. And I worked, my, I work, I worked hard and uh, <laughs> keep saying that. <laughs> Sorry, I worked my ass off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And I finished the training, I graduated, and, um, and I pursued my dream to do auth uh, robotic leg surgery. I went to Germany, I studied it, I researched it, I came back, and I decided to form a team. Um, working in a very highly uh, medical, legal, litigious society, I had to plan every single step and think about every single um, um, step that we do. I, had, I was very lucky to have, and for, very fortunate to have um, good people around me um, and a very good team that supported me. And we did our first case. Um, we did the second case, we did the third case, the media became aware of it. It went on TV and then letters started firing from everywhere. And then, which was not friendly letters unfortunately, uh, from my colleagues and um, and then we did the first 10 cases and I presented my results in a major uh, national meeting and this time I, I faced two of my senior colleagues who were my bosses um, they both shook my hand one of them said to me Munjid I knew you're crazy and I knew you're gonna do something like that good on you keep going um, don't let anyone stop you the second one looked at me and he said this is criminal um, I'm sure Long Bay Jail has a cell left for you and I'll make sure that I'll send you flowers. And I understand where he come from because he's very traditional. He doesn't want to um, um, breach the boundaries and want to always think inside the box. But unfortunately, medicine will not evolve. We would not be flying A380s if we don't think outside the box. We would be still riding horses. So. We're now sitting on 173 cases. We are the world leading center in Australia. Uh, we have done more robotic legs than anywhere else. And um, I've been honored uh, to be recognized by Prince Harry when he came and visited me in, uh, in my clinic. And I, I got invited to meet the queen uh, where um, I met, uh, um, where she honored um, uh, Michael Swain, the first British soldier that I treated, and I treated the eighth British soldier yesterday, and he's still in um, in the hospital. Um, look, everything is possible in this in this world. Um, one thing is important is that we always remember that we are human, and we look after each other as human beings. Um, finally, all I can say is that. Um, I do uh, beg your attention toward our fellow humans. There are 59.5 million people that are displaced on this planet. Um, a lot of them are skilled. 500,000 500, of them are, injured in, are in urgent need of placement. The vast majority of them are not as lucky as I am. I had the means uh, of getting somewhere. A lot of them are incarcerated or uh, locked up somewhere or died. At some stage, there were 1,252 people inside Curtin Detention Center. Among these people, there were 13 doctors. 12 of them are fully qualified specialists like me. Unfortunately, I'm the only one who is brave enough to go out and speak. And a lot of them keep telling me that I'm crazy because I'm speaking out. Because simply, They've been made ashamed of their situation as refugees because it's shameful to be a refugee here, which is sad. Refugees and people who seek asylum have the right to breach borders, to cross borders, if they are in fear of their life. If every single privileged one of us think and help another disadvantaged person, there will be a lot less unhappiness around this world. Thank you very much.